item of business is a member's business debate on motion 22945 in the name of Kenneth Gibson on establishing new no-take zones. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members wishing to debate press the request to speak buttons or indicate in the chat function if they're online. And I call on Kenneth Gibson to open the debate. Mr Gibson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank SNP, Labour, Green and independent colleagues for supporting my motion to enable tonight's debate to take place and for uh, colleagues who have stayed behind to listen to it after many delays this afternoon. I also wish to thank Howard Wood and Jenny Stark from the community of Arran Seabed Trust Coast for their excellent briefing. On 3rd of December, the Scottish Government announced the designation of 12 new special protected areas and four marine protected areas in our seas. That 37% of Scottish seas will now be covered by the Scottish MPA network was welcomed by environmentalists. Nature Scott said the announcement marked significant progress towards Scotland's marine conservation ambitions and is a positive step towards a nature-rich future. Why is that important? An estimated 3.2 billion people rely on fish for almost a fifth of their protein intake. Yet according to the UN's Food and Ag Agriculture Organisation, 90% of fish stocks worldwide are either fully fished or overfished at biologically unsustainable levels. This chronic overfishing has seen a depletion in biodiversity, which has in turn led to conditions where commercially viable fish cannot thrive. The Firth of Clyde provides a prime example where fishing was central to the economy for centuries. Before the Industrial Revolution, the Firth enjoyed an abundance of species. Huge herring shoals attracted cod, turbot, monkfish and, sh and sharks to the area. Fishing boomed and technological advances meant that by the 1940s, fishermen were catching over 40,000 40, tonnes of herring annually. Practices became more intensive and more destructive, relying increasingly on trawling to remain commercially viable. By the early 2000s, the Firth of Clyde was on the verge of becoming a marine desert, and the entire ecosystem was in jeopardy, with nephrops now the main fishery. This decimation of the Clyde's biodiversity, a tragedy in itself, was also devastating to Scottish fishing. Jobs are lost, boats decommissioned, and the industry is now a shadow of its former self. So MPAs are hugely important. Unfortunately, it can vary widely in effectiveness and will not alone restore and sustain marine biodiversity. The use of high-intensity fishing vessels capable of catching hundreds of tonnes of fish a day is not forbidden by MPAs. While there must, of course, be a place for sustainable pelagic fishing, we must combat biodiversity loss. A no-take zone is an area of sea and seabed from which no fish or shellfish can be taken, including from the shore area. Lamlash Bay No Take Zone was the first community-led marine reserve of its kind in Scotland when established in 2008. A modest 2.67 square kilometres, it was a result of 13 years of a campaign by coast, which I enthusiastically supported, and of course the support of Richard Lockhead, the Cabinet Secretary at the time, who delivered. Lamlash Bay was and is an excellent location for a no-take zone, being home to one of the largest merle beds in Scotland. Merle is an ideal habitat for small species, which can easily find food and hide from larger predators. However, Lamlash Bay is no, by no means unique in its ability to benefit from a no-take zone. There are marine areas all around Scotland abounding in natural beauty at severe risk of human over-exploitation. No-take zones are by far the most effective type of MPA and increase conservation benefits hugely. A study on biodiversity conservation at the University of Tasmania found that MPAs often fail to reach their full potential due to factors such as illegal harvesting, regulations that also allow detrimental legal fishing or migration of sea creatures outside boundaries because of inadequate reserve size. MPAs are most effective and well enforced, upwards of 100 square kilometres, and isolated by deep water or sand and well established, which can take years. A vital feature of an MPA success is that they are or contain substantial no-take zones where flora and fauna cannot be removed. Internationally, such zones are increasing in number, aiding both marine biodiversity and resilience to climate change. Australia's green zones previously made up just 5% of the Great Barrier Reef MPA, but now cover more than a third. Green zones have improved biodiversity and are home to a huge variety of organisms, including many rare, vulnerable and endangered species. Since the 1980s, coral trout biomass has more than doubled and the trout are larger and more abundant than those in the general use of blue zones. Evidence following tropical cyclone Hamish, which hit the reef in 2009, suggests that large, reproductively mature coral trout in green zones are also more resilient to the effects of natural disasters. Recreational activities such as boating, snorkelling and diving are allowed. However, fishing and coral collecting are entirely prohibited. Other international examples show the potential of no-take zones to restore ecosystems to a more complex and resilient state. The Palau Islands National Marine Sanctuary, which covers 80% of Palau's national waters, was described at this year's UN Ocean Conference as one of the world's most ambitious ocean conservation initiatives. 
at 475,077 square kilometres. The fully protected area is six times Scotland's entire landmass and nearly 178,000 times larger than Lamash Bay's no-take zone. Palau Waters hosts more than 1,300 species of fish and more than 400 species of hard coral. Established in 2015, regulations have been phased in to combat illegal fishing, and as early as 2017, the impact of the no-take zone was evident. Protected waters had twice the number of fish and five times as many predatory fish as those which were not. Since they are a key food source for other predators, a healthy fish population is an excellent indication of a thriving ecosystem. The sanctuary came fully into effect on the 1st of January this year. Palau is a nation of only 18,000 people, but with big ambitions. The Isle of Man's Ramsey Bay was designated the island's first marine nature reserve in October 2011, and there are now 10 designated marine reserves around the island, accounting for 10.8% of Manx waters. Ramsey Bay is around 95 square kilometres divided into zones, around half as highly protected, with no commercial uh, fishing permitted. These are coupled with a fisheries management zone co-managed by the Manx Department of Environment, Food and Agriculture and the Manx Fish Producers Organisation. This innovative approach means sustainable fishing can continue around no-take zones and the commercial benefits enjoyed responsibly. On Anna, I have seen first-hand the work done by Coast to combat biodiversity loss. Since Lamlash Bay no-take zone was designated, monitoring scientists have recorded double the living organisms on the seabed compared to adjacent, adjacent fished areas. A particular success has been the recovery of commercial species such as scallops and lobsters. Populations within the no-take zone have increased significantly in size and abundance. And a study in February this year found there are nearly four times as many king scallops as in 2010, and the size and number of both adult and juveniles has grown. Scallops also have significantly increased fertility compared to those outside the no-take zone and produce as many young scallops as fishing grounds over 20 times larger. Meanwhile, the population of European lobsters is, is quadruple the 2010 population. Lobsters are also much larger and more fertile, with the potential to produce up to 100 times more eggs than before the no-take zone was established. These benefits are not only felt in Lamlash Bay itself. Studies show there is evidence of lobster spillover into surrounding areas. And just last week, a local krill fisherman legally landed a lobster tagged uh, 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 within the no-take zone in 2018, almost two miles outside it. Research demonstrates that coast conservation efforts have been successful from a social as well as ecological standpoint. A poll of over 300 residents and visitors to Arran showed awareness at 95.2%, an increase of 23.5% in 2011, and support was very high at 97%. Arran residents and businesses consider research undertaken in Lamlash Bay to be very important economically, unsurprising given marine reserves enhance local fisheries and create jobs and new incomes through ecotourism. And Arran residents are also more optimistic about the health of their local seas compared to the Scottish average in a recent national poll carried out in Mabuni, Scotland. Presiding officer, new marine MPAs are very welcome and important in combating biodiversity loss. However, they do not negate the necessity for further measures. Lamlash Bay and the international examples I gave show the hugely positive impact no-take zones can have on the surrounding environment, as well as the potential for sustainable commercial fishing. I therefore urge the Scottish Government to look very closely at what Lamlash Bay no-take zone has achieved and the excellent work done by Coast to see how this success can be replicated with community support and engagement of many other locations in Scotland's waters. Thank you very much, Mr Gibson. And I call Colidia Beamish to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Ms Beamish, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And thanks go to Kenneth Gibson for bringing this motion to debate. With or without government acknowledgement, we are all in the midst of a climate and a nature emergency. And it has been my constant concern that the marine environment is neglected from these conversations. The international examples are very valuable that Kenneth Gibson has highlighted. Lamlash Bay is indeed a shining example as well of community empowerment and community environmentalism. Howard Wood and Coast have my utmost respect, and it was inspirational to visit the bay several years ago with Howard. The visit was a wake-up call for me. Dean Coast's video of the seabed regeneration honed my absolute commitment to help the work for a sustainable future for our coastal communities, based in the realities of the need to protect and enhance our inshore marine environment. And as, as, as we will hear no doubt later in the debate, the results of the highest level of marine protection show a dr dramatic return to nature and exploitative, when exploitative and extractive activities are removed. Precious and iconic 
Scottish species like the pretty pink marlbeds are able to really thrive. And as we heard from Kenneth Gibson, juvenile fish like cod and white and other small species are given protection in the lush seabed. It is the very withdrawal of our impact that means increased biodiversity abundance and a healthier seabed can develop. And this benefits the fishing communities working legally around the no-take zones, as this abundance spills over and stocks are more at sustainable levels. Marine wildlife rebounds, and the ocean is allowed space and time to recharge, which has been denied by the commercial fishing levels in some cases. It is senseless not to apply these lessons to broader spatial management of our seas if we want a fishing sector that thrives in sustainability. This government is under a legal duty to properly implement MPAs with management measures and apply the National Marine Plan duty to further fisheries decision making. And our committee report, the Eclair Committee report on regional marine plans will be out soon. And I'm sure the minister will take careful note of that and how vital and important it is that everybody works together, all, from all the sectors and the communities who are involved as we shape our future of good sea. As Open Seas pointed out in their briefing, the Scottish Government is failing to meet these duties, as proven by a leaked Nature Scott report that shows vital losses in marine habitat. In our seas, economic recovery and environmental recovery must go hand in hand. Coastal communities are in the front line of Brexit and the COVID-19 implications. Tackling these, along with climate and nature emergencies, demands a blue recovery. This is a key part of delivering a just transition for all. And I want to stress this must be done through consultation, as been highlighted by some of the briefings sent to us before this debate. Completely interconnected is the marine environment's role in climate mitigation. No-take zones can better protect key blue carbon habitats that sequester carbon emissions and help us meet impending and crucial emissions reductions targets. I am very pleased to support Kenneth Gibson's motion tonight and add Scottish Labour's voice to the calls for more no-take zones in Scottish waters. It's time to give these marine areas back their self-will. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Ms. Beamish, and I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Peter Chapman. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I start by congratulating Kenneth Gibson on securing the debate today? I was keen to speak because of my personal connection to both Lamlash and the wider Firth of Clyde, uh, which, being a Europe girl, I grew up sailing on and fishing. For our family, Aaron, and especially Lamb Lash, where you find the no-take zone, is a place of very special memories, because in the 1960s, we decamped to a button bend there every July at the Greenock Fair. And one of my very early memories of Lamb Lash Pier was seeing rows of sea urchins still with their spines on, caught by divers. They would then be scraped and buffed up to sell to tourists. And I seem to recall a couple of nice lavender examples on my and dressing table. At that time, we had no appreciation of the harm that such activities caused to biodiversity. Uh, the creature inside the shell of the sea urchin was scooped out and discarded, and not considered good for anything, not even as bait to use to catch haddock or whiting in nearby Brodick Bay, a summer pastime in those days, which soon disappeared with the fish. Uh, as wasteful as diving for sea urchins might have been back in 1966, it was not nearly so destructive as what came next. In preparation for today's debate, I learned that the government allowed trawlers uh, to come closer to Scottish shores in 1984. And that explains a lot for me, presiding officer, uh, because dredging is so destructive, so indiscriminate in its assault on the seabed, bashing sea urchins, tearing the limbs off starfish, and leaving an underwater wasteland. I recall far greater biodiversity in the Clyde as recently as the 1960s, 70s, and even early 80s, uh, when we fished um, in, uh, in and around Inverkip, where my father kept his boat. Uh, we went out every summer, uh, and we predominantly caught cod, uh, haddock, if you were lucky, flounder, and the, even the occasional skate. There were also sea trout uh, near Inverkip, and until the 1980s, my father caught uh, grey mullet. Uh, then all the fish just seemed to disappear. 
it didn't make a lot of sense to me then because the Clyde, of course, was getting cleaner. The only explanation I know now is overfishing and uncontrolled trawling after 1984. Now, with the success of the no-take zone in South, South Arran, we are seeing a way ahead and perhaps a way back to a time when I can still remember the Clyde was more fertile and a time before that when, as Kenneth Gibson said in his opening speech, uh, the Clyde was abundant uh, with herring. The town that I come from, Guruk, began as a herring port and it's not seen a herring for many a long year. Uh, the no Tech Zone was established in response to a campaign by Community of Arran Seabed Trust and designated by the then SNP Environment Minister Richard Lockhead in 2008. And I was really impressed to read that scientists monitoring the area have recorded a doubling of the living organisms on the seabed compared to adjacent fished areas. It's become an important fish nursery area as well for many important species, including juvenile cod. And I note from a report in the journal Frontiers of Marine Science uh, that found a remarkable turnaround in just a few short years, uh, with the number of scallops increasing uh, between two and five times. Uh, and uh, as Kenneth Gibson said, the number of lobsters not just increasing, but growing much larger. So the, in a short time, uh, we have seen the small no-take zone in the South Arran uh, improve species, not just in that small no-take zone, uh, but also in adjacent areas, because obviously uh, the fish and the crustaceans don't respect the boundaries. Um, yeah, it's only, it is the only no-take uh, zone in Scotland, which I was surprised to hear. Just imagine the effect of many more no-take zones right around our coast. Uh, not the whole coastline, but even a substantial part would make a huge difference. The benefits to tourism are already apparent, as anyone who tries to book accommodation in Lamb Lash less than a year in advance can testify. Uh, but, but many more no-take zones around Scotland would just not benefit just tourism, but also sustainable fishing uh, as species are able to spawn and grow in peace. Because this isn't anti-fishing, it's actually about establishing a sustainable fishing industry, which would be so beneficial to our coastal communities. So, in conclusion, presiding officer, the government is to be congratulated for setting up the no-take zone in South Arran in 2008. Let's build on that success by creating many more and tackle the nature emergency that we face alongside the climate emergency. And once again, I thank Kenneth Gibson for the debate. Thank you very much. And I call Peter Chapman to be followed by John Finney. Mr Chapman, please. Hi, thank you, Deputy Presiding, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I also welcome the opportunity to speak on behalf of my Scottish Conservative colleagues on this uh, very important debate. Uh, and also, I thank Kenneth Gibson for bringing it uh, to the Chamber tonight. As we've heard, a no-take zone is defined as an area of sea and seabed from which no fish or shellfish can be taken, including from the shore area. And there are currently four such zones in the UK, all of which I believe have proved successful. I will talk more about our Scottish no-take zone, but the others in the UK are in the Medway Estuary, uh, at Flamborough Head in North Yorkshire, and at Lundy Island off Devon. And our Scottish one, established in 2008 in, in, in Lamlash Bay, has, as we've heard, gone from strength to strength. Within the past 10 years, researchers have found that the size, fertility and abundance of commercial species such as lobsters and scallops has significantly increased within the boundaries of the no-take zone. Indeed, I am pleased to note that lobsters are now over four times more abundant in the no-take zone than in the adjacent areas. Seabed biodiversity has also increased by 50%. And observations from divers and fishermen and anglers indicate that the seabed and the fish are recovering. And to quote Howard Wood, the co-founder of the Community of Arran Seabed Trust, he says, without destructive forms of fishing, this amazing complex seabed allows more species to inhabit, to hide and to feed. You can see what happens when nature is allowed to thrive. And I was also add to, to his list of the uh, inhabit, hide and feed, the ability to breed. And it is important to, to uh, 
recognize that as fish grow older, unlike us humans, they become more fertile. And many species spend more of their energy producing eggs as they grow older and as they grow larger. And this is why no-take zones can be so vital to help species repopulate the surrounding area. Now, conservationists argue, conservationists argue that up to a quarter of all UK waters should be or could be no fish zones. Now, there is no doubt that this would allow stocks of fish such as North Sea cod to replenish. However, I do doubt if this would be if this would go down well with our fishermen. Fishermen all, always argue that no matter how many crabs, lobster, or fish are in the sea. If coastal communities cannot make a living from them, then that can't be a way forward. So, like in most arguments, it's all about a sensible balance. And I do believe, I do think that uh, no-take zones would be beneficial. There's no doubt it would be beneficial in the long run. And it's, often, it's not often we get a win-win situation. But I genuinely think that, this, that more no-take no zone could be good or would be good for the environment but it would also be good for our fishermen. So, um, with the, to, uh, to progress, so I think it's, it's, it's a, you know, on balance, I would definitely support more no-take zones, and I would encourage the Scottish Government to begin to do the work to allow us to progress the principle of more no-take zones. But it is important that part of that work is, and in fact, it is essential that part of that work is that we consult with our fishermen and we get their buy-in to the proposals. We must take them with us and not tell them what has been decided from on high. It is only by getting their support for no-take zones that they will be a success. So, presiding officers, I believe that is the way forward. Let's take our fishermen with us and uh, I think we can have a win-win for all concerned. Officer, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Chapman. And I call John Finney, the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Finney, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I join with colleagues in congratulating Kenneth Gibson in securing this important debate and also congratulate, in terms of the motion, everyone involved in the success of Lamlash Bay No Take Zone and the excellent work carried out by the Community of Arran Seabed Trust Coast, as it's more commonly known. Uh, for the protection and restoration of the marine environment, which will ultimately sustain the livelihood of those dependent on fishing and tourism. Now, you often hear the phrase, a sea of opportunity, and, and I agree there's a sea of opportunity awaits, but not if we allow the grab-everything approach of the reckless elements of uh, our fishing sector. Um, it, it will be the case there will be a sea of opportunity if we follow the no-take approach. So, rather... Uh, it's important we recognise that to have a sustainable industry, you must have a sustainable environment for that um, industry to work within. And I think when we hear of issues like doubling of species, then there's confirmation that this approach is right. Now, the Scottish um, Creole Fishermen's Association have said that years of overfishing and poor management have meant that future generations will inherit an asset that's a shadow of its former self. So we must all redouble our efforts to make sure that isn't the case. And I do wish the SCFF every success in making the case for a judicial review of the Scottish Government decision affecting uh, competing interests in the um, inner sound of sky. Because I do agree that it's often perceived as competing interests. I think if we all have the common interest of ensuring a vibrant marine environment, then I think, as other speakers have said, we can um, see some uh, progress. Issues and uh, Alistair Sinclair of the, the SCCF um, it says that coolers and uh, trawlers are left to sort things out for themselves, and part of that is about year conflict. And it's not an equality of arms, um, and it, it is uh, inconceivable, as has been said, that the mean environment would improve if trawling expanded at the expense of peeling. And, of course, as has been said by others, uh, dredgers are struck beyond measure. We should refer to the fact that there are Investigations into six incidents of suspected illegal scallop dredging since March 2020. Um, so the fact that we don't have an inshore fisheries bill is disappointing. But I, I do understand that there's common purpose across the parties in many respects. What we need is to take some of the machoism out of the discussions about the fishing industry 
the commercial uh, fishing isn't about winning things. It's about international cooperation. It's about the precautionary principle. Um, fish don't recognise international boundaries any more than they recognise the, the boundaries of no-take zones. But what, of course, they do recognise is the fact that uh, the environment is very better for them to flourish in. And we've heard some of the important statistics around that. Of course, what's most important is that any decisions taken are uh, made uh, uh, from an evidence base and supported by a robust impact assessment. Um, and then we must see an end to overfishing and uh, an end to discards. Um, and the creation of more no-take zones uh, would bring a lot of developments. We've heard of the more protected marine, marine protected areas, and we need more monitoring. We need more robust policing. But we also need to understand the limitations of the legislation and the evidential thresholds that have to be overcome. Um, uh, which affects the uh, number of prosecutions, successful prosecutions that there are. Mention has been made about 1984, three-mile limit. This is about spatial management. This is about cooperation. This is about things being community-led. This is about the benefits of the environment for ecotourism. It is a way of ensuring um, aspects of climate breakdown are addressed in a very positive way. I think a seas will flourish. We see no take more no takes on, and I congratulate the community for all their work in that regard. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Paul Wheelhouse to close the Scottish Government. Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank uh, Kenny Gibson for launching his motion on what is clearly an important issue to the Government, uh, many members and their communities, such as on Aaron. And I thank uh, Mr Gibson and indeed, uh, all colleagues for their contributions today, but Mr Gibson in particular. Uh, who set out the importance of fish and seafood as a source of nutrition and some of the key findings for monitoring of the no-take zone in uh, at Lamlash Bay. Uh, but I do thank my members for their contributions, which has shared a range of views, highlight the importance of the marine environment to our well-being. Uh, members will, of course, be aware this is not my portfolio, so I should explain that I'm covering at short notice for my colleague, the Minister for Rural Affairs and the Natural Environment, who is on compassionate leave. So whilst I have uh, very fond uh, memories of my time as Minister for Environment and Climate Change, I don't have the depth of current knowledge of the issues raised today, and so I apologise in advance if, uh, depending on points I've been raised today, I, I wasn't able to respond to all interventions that members have made in the debate today. However, where necessary, I'll ensure issues are followed up afterwards. Uh, through our future fisheries management strategy, though, we, we want to ensure that we've we are fishing at sustainable levels and that the right protections are in place for our marine environment, underpinned by a robust scientific evidence base, uh, which John Finney just re referenced there in, in closing, and importantly, uh, the enforcement regime, which he also referenced. We have already confirmed that, where necessary and appropriate, additional measures will be introduced, for example, to protect vulnerable spawning and juvenile fish areas, and to um, remote electronic monitoring for the pelagic and scallop fleets. As, and as required for other sectors of the fleet. The deployment programme has already fitted remote electronic monitoring, putting cameras to 30 per cent of Scottish scallop dredge vessels, which hopefully will help with the issues that um, uh, Joan McAlpine raised in her discussion around uh, Inverkip. And as part of our wider modernisation programme, 40 crew vessels in the Outer Hebrides inshore fisheries pilot have also been equipped with low-cost vessel tracking systems. Uh, for the bulk of my speech, I'll outline some of the marine conservation successes of the last 10 years and highlight current work, and I'll take a, a brief look into the future. The establishment of the Lamlash Bay no-take zone in 2008 was indeed a groundbreaking decision uh, by Richard Lockhead and following a long and persistent campaign by the community of Arran uh, Seabed Trust or Coast. It was a bold and laudable move uh, by, by Richard uh, Lockhead when he was Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and Environment, of course. They also recognise the continued efforts of COAST to work with academic partners, most notably University of York, to monitor and assess changes that have occurred over the last 12 years. Uh, and this has not only produced a substantial evidence base, it's also given a lot of students a great opportunity for field work during their studies. Uh, Kenneth Gibson uh, referenced one point which I'd really just re uh, refer to when he des uh, described the evidence that um, there was a marine desert in the area. I understand I mean, Scotland uh, to take a review of the Clyde in 2012, and that concluded it wasn't indeed a marine desert, but clearly it did recognise there was a need for some improvement. So um, it, it was not as perhaps as bleak as being suggested, but certainly room for improvement. But we should also 
not forget the fishing industry, as uh, Peter Chapman referenced to her the often forgotten component of the success of Landlash Bay. There's been a very high level of compliance over the last 12 years, I understand, which has obviously helped to create the conditions now being reported on. And this serves as a strong reminder of the need to have those who will be directly affected by management measures fully involved and engaged in decision-making processes. In that respect, I very much agree with what Peter Chapman was saying. Uh, presiding officer, before the COVID-19 pandemic uh, took hold, 2020 was being termed as a super year for biodiversity, with important negotiations for a new global biodiversity framework to take place and the UN Climate Change Conference of, of parties to be held in Glasgow. And as members are aware, these issues have been rolled forward into 2021. Uh, Joan McAlpine made this point, but she's absolutely right to say there's clearly a, a strong link between the uh, natural or nature con emergency alongside the climate emergency, and therefore those talks in 2021 will be particularly important. But 2010 was also a super year for biodiversity. That year, uh, there were three significant milestones, which we, we need to remind ourselves of. The Main Scotland Act 2010 received royal assent, creating new domestic powers and duties for marine planning, licensing and conservation. The OSPAR Convention adopted the Northeast Atlantic Environment Strategy, and the Convention of Biological Diversity adopted a global framework for biodiversity known as the HE targets. Uh, these three things have been significant drivers of our work in the last 10 years to improve the marine environment. We now have a national marine plan which guides sustainable development and have established three marine planning partnerships. We have a marine licensing system designed to keep activities within environmental limits. And we have expanded the MPA network from less than 10% to 37%, as uh, Kenneth Gibson uh, noted earlier in his speech. This year alone, we've nearly doubled the size of the network, including the designation of Europe's largest marine protected area. And these represent a huge leap forward in a decade, and it's something I think we should all be very proud of. Rising officer, as we, uh, we appreciate that we haven't fully um, addressed and achieved all the targets from 2010, Yesterday, the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform published a statement of intent on biodiversity. And that statement made it clear that current projects to improve the status of biodiversity will continue and be enhanced where possible until a new Scottish biodiversity strategy is agreed. This is relevant to the marine environment, where we are working to deliver fisheries management measures for the MPA network and ensuring the most vulnerable habitats are adequately protected outside the MPA network. Our progress with these has been slower than originally planned this year due to the response to COVID-19 and the impact of EU exit uh, preparations. This important work will continue over the next few years and will build on the significant stakeholder engagement that has taken place over the last decade. The presiding officer, this statement of intent also commits to delivering a new Scottish biodiversity strategy within 12 months of the new global framework being agreed by the Convention on Biological Diversity in 2021. And members will also wish to note that a new OSPAR Northeast Atlantic Environment Strategy is also expected in 2021 as well. This means that a new course will need to be set for 2030 so that we can meet the new international targets that are expected to be agreed next year. In setting um, that new course, consideration can be given to the need for tools such as no-take zones, which uh, members across the Chamber have called for, and other forms of strict protection to achieve the outcomes that we desire. Presiding officer, I, I thank Kenny Gibson once again for bringing this uh, debate to the chamber. There been great contributions from colleagues in the debate. Uh, I note that um, uh, Claudia Beamish mentioned specifically mural beds. Uh, I know uh, from my previous role uh, just how important they are, as she quite rightly identifies they are beautiful, but they also contribute to sequestering carbon dioxide and therefore important uh, to our attempts to, to control uh, damaging climate change. But I also want to thank Howard Wood and the team at Coast for the long-standing efforts to promote conservation of the marine environment. I uh, great fortune to meet Howard Wood at Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco, and it was great to see him influencing uh, a debate at an international level there, taking the example of what we can achieve in Scotland and communities like Aaron uh, to a global audience. And we've come a long way since 2008, and we should celebrate the progress we've made with conservation of the marine environment. And I very much uh, acknowledge that importance of this debate. The journey isn't, of course, yet complete, and we recognise there is much yet still to do, but many of our successes have been down to significant amounts of stakeholder engagement and ensuring that the wide range of views and perspectives are taken into account. And whilst this does take time, 
it uh, does result in better outcomes. So I hope the stakeholders continue to engage in the marine conservation issues as they have done over the last decade. So the next de next decade is just as successful as the last. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting of Parliament.